it's not a wild guess to say that a very high percentage of the thousands of people who tune into this show are political junkies. And probably a big piece of that number consider themselves progressives. So with the Democratic convention coming up just a couple of weeks away, you'd think I was going to do a lot on that topic. Well, you're wrong because conventions don't matter. And even more so, political platforms don't matter. And I say that as a bona fide elected delegate for Bernie Sanders, for whom I just already cast my virtual ballot for his nomination. So I'm going to get into that more in a moment. And then I'm going to talk with my guest today about a major crisis facing every single state, a crisis that will hurt people and a crisis that could be avoided. This is Jonathan Tassini, and welcome to the show for August 5th, 2020. As usual, a reminder, our major sponsor is the American Postal Workers Union, which fights for dignity, respect, and good wages for its 200,000 members and retirees and 2,000 private sector mail workers. Now, you too can become a sponsor of this show. You can do that in one of two ways. Either you can go over to workinglife.org, click on the podcast tab, and look for a link to Patreon where you can become a one-time sponsor or a regular monthly sponsor at whatever level you can afford. Or, if you're more comfortable, you can use ActBlue. We've partnered with ActBlue. So you can just find us at ActBlue at the Working Life Network with Jonathan Tassini. You can see the link there. And you can become either, again, either a one-time sponsor or a regular monthly sponsor. Of course, we'd love if you became a regular sponsor. It helps us bring this show to you. And I think we're bringing you information you're not finding in most other places. Now, in a long piece that I wrote, which you can find posted at workinglife.org under the very subtle headline, get your heads out of your collective asses, because I do subtlety really well, I laid out some thoughts on why I thought progressives have squandered important energy, time, and resources obsessing about the Democratic Convention. We have a golden opportunity to speak to the 30 to 50 million people who are now unemployed or underemployed because of the pandemic, who now have lost faith in the system. And this is a system that has screwed them for many, many decades. But people's eyes have really opened up because of the pandemic, or so I think. But because of the weakness of a segment of the progressive movement, especially those of us who have defined ourselves as part of the movement that's been inspired and has followed Bernie Sanders, we aren't taking full advantage of that chance and opportunity. Week after week since the pandemic erupted, while tens of thousands of people have been dying and millions are getting sick, and now tens of millions have lost enhanced unemployment benefits, thousands upon thousands of valuable organizing hours and energy were wasted on irrelevant party politics surrounding the Democratic Party convention. Now quick, without searching the internet, Tell me what was in the 2016 Democratic Party platform. What were the headings or the main resolutions? Now, no one can actually answer that question because party platforms are irrelevant. I actually was at the 2016 platform committee debate. And honestly, I can remember a few issues, mainly the fight over the Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal because I was involved in the national opposition to this odious deal. But as far as the rest of the platform, I, and I would wager 95% of the people who were actually at that debate could not tell you what was in the final platform. Millions of people who could be drawn into the movement don't give a damn about party platforms or rules fights or conventions, all of which is of interest to a microscopic sliver of political activists. Millions of people are trying to keep the lights on or just a roof over their heads. And yet, a majority of Bernie Democratic Party delegates have been focused on entirely meaningless platform committee meetings. Now, by playing the platform game and the related fight over party rules, progressives have played right into the hands of the very quote-unquote establishment that so many rage against. This is the establishment's arena. They have the votes at the convention. And here's the bigger point. No president, no president ever made a decision based on a party platform. 
The platform debate and the debate over the rules is really the purview of what I call the meal ticket activists. People who are angling for jobs, foundation money, some sort of illusory cult-like influence who desperately want to be on the task forces or committees, all entities that will have virtually no lasting influence. Or these are people who simply want to rage about how unfairly they've been treated. The fight over the Medicare for All platform issue is just one example that I would point out in a long list of missed opportunities. As I wrote recently in a piece for the New York Daily News, what a colossal waste of energy. It was obvious the votes were overwhelmingly against Medicare for All. So was the exercise simply to make headlines or feel superior knowing you would not win? Because progressives could have chosen a much better politically advantageous path that sidesteps the insider game in favor of actually a national appeal about Medicare for all to a desperate country. Because right at this moment, there is a bicameral, meaning both in the House and Senate, pandemic bill that has been, been introduced called the Healthcare Emergency Guarantee Act. It is sponsored by a significant group of House members, including Karen Bass, who's rumored to be a contender for vice president, and in the Senate, lo and behold, Bernie Sanders. Now, if passed, the bill would enroll millions of, of Americans into Medicare, any of the roughly 35 million unemployed who will lose their employer-based health care and have no other health care coverage because of the pandemic. And it's also going to allow, this bill would, people currently insured, but not insured in a broad enough sense and paying way too much. Now, think about that. With one step, a huge percentage of the people would benefit for the first time from Medicare coverage. They would see great savings to their ravaged pocketbooks and experience that ease of use in getting care. That experience could then turn into an almost unstoppable political force for implementing Medicare for all across the nation at some point, maybe even quite soon. Politically, organizing to push the bill community by community is a winner. Joe Biden's wing of the party would be in a much more difficult position arguing against a short-term pandemic-tied Medicare for all option. After all, he and the party have made Donald Trump's abject failure at managing the pandemic a central part of the election campaign. And that failure has been underscored by the threat to the health of people, many of whom died or became unnecessarily significantly ill from the coronavirus because they could not afford to go to a doctor. Now, even if the bill fails to pass, given the certain opposition from Mitch McConnell and a lack of support to date from Nancy Pelosi, progressives leading such a national campaign would leave in place a far more robust, long-lasting imprint among people about the benefits of Medicare for All. A large share of the blame of this debacle sits with a consistent cadre of entrenched organizations and a small circle of folks who curry favor with donors and send out fundraising emails, which fan the anger of grassroots activists by hyping the fight against the quote unquote establishment, even though those very organizations have a pretty bad track record littered with ineptitude and frankly just empty sloganeering. We only win when we fight based on organization and mobilizing. Does anyone think a single Black Lives Matter activist asked whether she or he should mass in the streets based on the party platform or what Joe Biden thinks about Black Lives Matter? You think a single person who was marching in the most exciting uprising underway in recent times even knows what the party platform says, either on Black Lives Matter racial justice, or anything? The answer is obviously no. And if you hear a progressive leader say roughly, we can do all of this at the same time, here's one thing you can know. That person has no clue about strategy. And you might as well look at his or her actual track record, not some cultish devotion. And they have no idea about the real struggles of actual people in the streets.
Most people today are struggling on multiple fronts, trying to keep themselves and their families safe and healthy, looking for a job and navigating an entirely different life, especially folks who have kids at home. They don't have time for all this activism. They barely have a smidgen of time to make a phone call. Only the meal ticket activists see a world where people somehow can juggle the insanity of today and devote more energy to activism. So as I've said many times, we should mostly ignore the Democratic Party convention. Let it happen. If you want, tune in online, but then organize up to and including a general strike for real things. On this show, for example, I outlined a few weeks ago something I call a beat the pandemic and aid the people $6.5 trillion stimulus act. That's the only way to control the pandemic. Shut down the country for at least a month and order people into their homes. We can do so by making sure people staying at home earn an actual paycheck, can pay the bills, and then come out on the other end without crushing debt. We should be organizing for that, not around a meaningless party platform. Or we could organize around the idea of making sure everybody gets a free vaccine. Or for the safety and health of workers who are confronting the worst safety and health crisis for workers in generation. Now, I'm not guaranteeing we can win the stuff that I'm in favor of. It's a hard hill to climb. But Black Lives Matter activists were not deterred by confronting centuries-old racism head-on in the streets. And overnight, that activist courage and energy has advanced concrete, real, anti-racist efforts. Now, of course, there's a lot, long way to go, but what a change there's been in such a short time. And they've made far more change than the years of progressive carping and whining about the unfair, quote-unquote, establishment. And in that organizing, we would already be building what will be an obvious need to have a progressive counter to a Biden administration's actual policies. It will actually enhance the ability to defeat as Bernie Sanders has always held is an important goal and has correctly said so ever since he began his 2020 campaign to defeat the most dangerous president in our lifetimes and make the Republican Party a rump presence in the country and then turn our attention to changing the Democratic Party and getting rid of those very establishment types who are turning over the country to corporate lobbyists and the elite. Let's act like organizers responding to people's real needs. Now to the deep hole facing states. The pandemic has ripped a hole into every state budget in the country to the tune collectively of over $550 billion. That's more than half a trillion dollars in money that states don't have, which translates into millions of people losing their jobs and services being decimated that we rely on every single day. And it doesn't have to be this way. If ideology wasn't more important for Republicans and some Democrats who should be pouring money into states and closing those big deficits, deficits that remember were no fault of states. These sudden steep drops in revenue weren't caused by local mismanagement. The deficits were simply caused by one man, Donald Trump, who dismissed the pandemic, called it a hoax, and made fun of people. People who at that time knew, especially experts, medical experts, who knew that there was a building calamity. Trump essentially caused the economic crisis that is burying states in mountains of red ink. To talk more about this, it's great to have on the show Michael Leachman, Vice President for State Fiscal Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And maybe before we dive into the specifics of the deficit and the crisis facing states, Michael, maybe we should give my viewers, my audience, a little bit of the bigger macro picture, perhaps it's obvious. Why should we care that states have these deficits and are facing this crisis? Why does it matter? 
Well, it really matters to our families and our communities because states and localities are primarily responsible in our country for funding our education systems, our schools and our higher education systems. They're, uh, they're, they have a big role to play in our healthcare system. Something like 90% of the public infrastructure in the country outside of defense is owned at the state and local level. So, you know, if states don't have money to do those things, then it really has a big impact on our lives. Mm -hmm. And to add to that, I assume there are two aspects of this. Obviously, when states can't pay for services, then all of a sudden the garbage collection suffers and all sorts of other things, parks go on uh, serviced. Uh, I know that, for example, in my state in Oregon, just because of the state crisis looking forward, they furloughed and cut jobs they normally have in the summers, and they've had to close some campgrounds because they simply can't keep up with the ability to service them and make them safe for people. And then you just multiply that 10, 20 times bigger, and you can just see the way services are affected. And, and we're going to get into this in specifics, it's jobs. I mean, there's real um, jobs at the government and local level, but certainly at the state level, that affect the incomes of people. Yeah, that's right. I mean, states and localities have already laid off about a million and a half, laid off or furloughed uh, about a million and a half workers. And, um, and as you say, that has an effect on the, obviously the, their income and their family's ability to put food on the table it also has a broader economic effect because it means those people aren't spending at the local hardware store or whatever. And, uh, and so it worsens the recession and, and makes it harder to, to, get a recovery, to get a recovery going. And then of course, as you allude to, there's uh, effects on the services, the crucial basic fundamental public services that um, these workers are providing as teachers and as, nurses and uh, and uh, and 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 park district uh, su supervisors who are running youth programs, et cetera, uh, all of those services uh, that people and businesses rely on. And it, you made a great point about people not being able to spend at the local hardware store. And this is where it seems to me that the Mindless ideology is taking over smart economics, and I mean mindless ideology, especially from the Republican Party in Washington, that just – they don't want to give aid to states. There's something somehow bad about that, and if you in fact want to have an economic recovery, which apparently that's the only thing that the Trump administration cares about is what the economy is doing in the pandemic, not that thousands of people are dying and hundreds of thousands are – people are being made sick and potentially suffering health consequences for decades to come. It's a reality that if you're not going to give money to states to do all the things we just discussed, you can't look for an economic recovery, however that's defined. Yeah, states and localities are a big part of the economy, and that's a lot of workers, uh, you know, about 20 million workers nationally. And, uh, and so uh, neglecting, allowing uh, states and localities to lay off workers and uh, cut back on their spending, cut contracts to businesses, uh, cut back on their spending in other ways, just from, I mean, setting aside the human effects, which are, uh, you know, the most important um, uh, effects, just the purely economic impact is substantial. And uh, it really, it really is a no-brainer uh, to provide, to make sure that states and localities have that will have what they need um, to avoid those layoffs and avoid those spending cuts. I mean, we, the economy is already bad. Why? You know, the last thing that we need is is more layoffs. So other they're, they're than totally being totally unavoidable. <laughs> so other than being dumb economics. It has to be just mindless ideology. I mean, you're based in Washington. You've watched this process go back and forth. What else is the reason for not giving money to states other than mindless ideology? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are 
reasons that have been given don't make a lot of sense, right? It's uh, as if it's only a blue state problem. This is a blue state bailout, which is obviously not true. The pandemic has reached every state. State blue and red state revenues are are down substantially. In fact, some of the red states have the deepest shortfalls because they have a combination of the pandemic and oil prices falling, and some of the oil dependent states have especially deep shortfalls. Um, or, right, you, you hear that um, states already have enough, they've gotten some aid already, that's, that's enough, when it's very clear it's far, what the, the little bit of aid they've gotten so far is far too small given the magnitude, the sort of extraordinary and historic magnitude of the crisis. So yeah, I do think that it comes down, appears to come down to uh, ideology. You, you know, um, uh, they, in the one of one form, the primary form of aid that's been provided so far, uh, the Treasury Department ruled that that aid could not be used by states and localities to make up for their revenue losses, um, but but they could give it to businesses who had whose revenues were down. Because, or because of the pandemic, but you can't give it to uh, to protect. So that's protecting jobs in the private sector, but you can't give it to protect jobs of teachers and healthcare workers and other in the, others in the public sector. And it seems like there's no good reason for that. We don't have two economies. We have one economy, and there's no there's no reason to make a distinction between the pri public sector and the private private sector in terms of the economic effects. And one last macro point, then we'll dig into some of the important numbers that you've pulled together, you and your colleagues. It seems to me that one of the other points about this being mindless ideology is that actually the federal government, and especially, I'll just be direct, the Trump administration and Donald Trump made this worse by ignoring the pandemic. I think this is just a fact that we all know now that had the government responded, the federal government seen this as a serious issue back in January and February, the actual economic crisis might have been much more smaller. It would have been contained, the pandemic, perhaps within a month or two. Again, we know that it's hard to chart all this, but in a, in a way, the federal government and especially the Republicans in government in the United States Senate, especially Mitch McConnell, they're blaming states and saying, we're not going to let you deal with your deficits, your shortfalls, even though it was really our screw up that caused you to have this. In other words, it wasn't as if states mismanaged their finances. They did something wrong. They were overspending, God forbid. It was, in fact, the screw up at the federal level that caused the pandemic to blow up, to explode and the states to suffer. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear compared comparing uh, what's happened here to what's happened in other countries. I'm not a public health expert, but but it's very clear that the pandemic is the cause of the fiscal crisis in states. It, you know, states actually um, had managed their their uh, rainy day fund. They'd saved relatively large amounts heading into this pandemic. They had about 50 percent more in their rainy day funds as a share of their budgets than they did heading into the Great Recession. Um, spending general fund, state general fund spending as a share of the economy was significantly below where it had been heading to the Great Recession. Um, their unemployment insurance trust funds were most in most states were met the Department of Labor standards for being prepared for a recession. But nobody could have expected that we're gonna have a global pandemic and we were gonna have to um, shut down our economy in order to keep us safe. And that is very clearly what has caused the fiscal crisis in states. So, you know, any suggestion otherwise that it is a, is a distraction and, and, and rhetoric. So you gave a great lead in to kind of dig into some of these numbers. One of the things that I noted in looking at your excellent charts and looking at the decline as a percent of pre-COVID-19 revenue projections is that the real disasters that states are looking at are actually in the budgets of 2021 and 2022, as I assume their revenues decline even more 
and they deplete whatever reserves and rainy day funds they have. Is that right? Yeah, that's basically right. I mean, the keep in mind that uh, in almost all the states, the we are in fiscal year 21 because in most states that started July 1st and will extend into the middle of next year, right? So it's, it's this year and the subsequent year um, that states will continue to have shortfalls. They already closed sizable shortfalls for their 20, fiscal year 20. Um, you know, it was sort of, it, the pandemic hit in the last, more or less in the last quarter. They had to, their revenues declined substantially. Um, uh, and they had to make cuts in order to balance that budget. But now they're looking at a fiscal year where their revenues are way down. They have already spent some of their reserves, as, as you note. Uh, and, um, and most of them have written, at this point, they're still waiting on the federal government to do the right thing and, and step up to the plate. So most of them have actually written budgets that they know they're gonna have to come back and rework uh, and so if we, if federal government shirks those responsibilities, states are going to have to come back and they're already planning to come back in special sessions or um, to take action in other ways to cut their, they have to balance their budget. So you have to cut spending or raise taxes or some combination of those things in, in order to move ahead. And that'll continue into next year uh, in the fiscal 22 is starts in the middle of next year. And the projections that we have from all of the forecasters that people look at, the Federal Reserve and the Congressional Budget Office and others indicate that, or you know, they think that, and, and that's pretty widespread, that forecasters believe that unemployment will still remain relatively high at the, in the second half of last, next year. And that will funnel through to less revenue for, for states and less ability to pay for teachers and healthcare workers and others. And to put it in regular people's terms, when people are unemployed and the economy is still in the ditch, people can't pay taxes. They the Sales in places where states rely on sales taxes, obviously people are not buying stuff. And so the revenue essentially shrinks to states, which then in turn means states have to look at cutting services. And then I want to talk specifically now about cutting jobs. You mentioned, and I remember this statistic elsewhere in the last few weeks when I've been talking about this, that 1.5 million jobs have been lost either through layoffs or furloughs to date in the first few months of the pandemic. What's right. the projection of how many people could lose their jobs at the government level, local and state, from your point of view, let's say in the coming year, if money is not forthcoming from the feds to make up these gaps? Yeah. We haven't done a specific projection of that, but it's a substantial number. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, states, as I said, states are kind of holding on. They're, they're doing their best to wait, and, uh, but, but more, more layoffs and more permanent layoffs, not most of what's happened so far have been furloughs. And the hope is that some of those people get, at least will get their jobs back, but more permanent layoffs coming. I saw somewhere projection, and I actually don't remember the source right at the second, of somewhere around another 2 million jobs in the first, through the first six months of 2021. Does that make sense to you, roughly? I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised by that number. Um, and I, I'm sorry I don't have that in front of me. I know that the Economic Policy Institute uh, has done some projections um, that I, I wish I'd carried with me, but... Uh, but folks could check that out, and, and I wouldn't be surprised at the number that you're, that you're quoting. Now, another aspect of this, obviously, is people's pensions. And what's interesting to me is there's not been a whole lot of conversation within this discussion about aid to states about the way in which pensions have been hit for public employees and retirees. And again, if you're thinking about down the road economics and having the economy retire when retired people and people retiring now or say in the next few years if they don't have money coming from their funds and if those funds are depleted especially in in situations where pensions are not defined benefit pensions but defined contribution pensions meaning the defined contribution pensions are often tied to where the stock market is the concern is that people have lost again retirees money in their pensions in the same way 
that they lost money during the Great Recession. So retirees, public employees who've worked hard through no fault of their own are getting hit again. Now, the stock market seems to have recovered a little bit, which is a whole other topic about how crazy that is that the stock market seems to be operating completely separate from the reality of actual people. Let's put that aside. But the truth is that people continue to get hit in their IRAs and what they're relying on, and public pensions are a fundamental part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm related to that. It's it's a real concern that states whose revenues are really squeezed will um, will turn to cut back to, to cuts to benefit yeah. cuts. That's certainly what happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession. That um, you know the, the the fact that the states didn't have the revenue was then used as an argument to say, well, the only response here is to cut back on on uh, substantially on pension benefits and you did see i think i think every state had some kind of um changes in their in their pension systems uh over the last decade and and in, in and in general that what that's meant is that for new employees uh the ben the pub pension benefits that are available to them are substantially weaker um uh, than than they are than they were before the before the great recession hit I want to weave in another aspect of this, another theme into how government cuts affect real people. And that has to do with racism, since we're in this moment in the country where, thank God, we're talking about racism in a much more explicit way, partly and largely because of the murder of George Floyd and the uprising in the streets. But government cuts and state cuts really affect people of color disproportionately from white people, and in two ways, and I want you to comment, first of all, on this one, which is that disproportionately, people of color, especially African Americans and Hispanics, have government jobs. And in part, that's largely because if you were African American, you tried to get in the private sector, racism was a serious block to that. At least in the public sector, affirmative action and somewhat of a more transparent process happened so that African Americans and Hispanics were able to get government jobs when they were blocked from getting fair employment in the private sector. So for example, as I remember the statistics, I wrote them down, 20% of African Americans uh, hold government jobs, meaning of government jobs, 20% are African Americans. And for 10% are Hispanic. So there's a certain there's a large part of racism that weaves through government cuts, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and in addition, the cuts that typically happen fall hardest on uh, on the on families that are struggling the most and because of historic racism and ongoing forms of discrimination and bias, those people are disproportionately people of color. Uh, and 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 um, and so it's not just the cut. I mean, we already have, for instance, uh, a school s school system nationally where uh, where schools that are attended disproportionately by children of color receive less funding than uh, than schools that are that are more heavily white. And so, cuts for for schools that are already underfunded. And for kids that need more support because of this environment that we've created through our policies, um, you know that the pain is felt the most. There's a, there's a whole range of other uh, damaging effects. I mean, another thing that happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession is that we funded in funding our courts and our police systems, we shifted away from using general taxation more heavily to criminal legal fees and fines. So we saw this play out in Ferguson, Missouri, for ex instance, where the police department was um, was uh, raising significant amount of their revenue and and was being told to raise revenue by you know going out and getting fees from people who had a hard time affording it. It's, it has all kinds of damaging effects. People end up getting locked up just because they are you know don't have the money to be able to pay the fine it ends up having all kinds of uh, deleterious effects and i want to circle back to a point that you made and and kind of underscore this part of this racism within the economy that happens 
is direct result from generations of racism because of the creation of a wealth gap, essentially, that people of color have less wealth, family wealth compared to whites. And this goes directly to your point about schools. And your colleague, Nicholas Johnson, wrote a terrific article about that, which he talked about racial inequities. And he focused on specifically schools, and I'm just going to quote from his paper, that cuts in state funding, for example, force K-12 public schools to rely more heavily on local funding, which comes mainly from property taxes. And obviously, when those taxes, now I'm not quoting from him, I'm just riffing, those taxes are based on property values. And when you have that wealth gap, and you look at where schools are, and where wealthy white neighborhoods are, therefore their property taxes are higher. There's more wealth that comes out of white neighborhoods. Those schools tend to be then better funded than schools where um, in predominantly people of color neighborhoods and where essentially from redlining and from the huge wealth gap. And so there it, it's, a, it's a very subtle thing that's not talked about, but has huge impact on certainly children. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, our government policy deliberately segregated uh, African Americans in certain neighborhoods and disinvested in those neighborhoods, and so yeah, you, you end up and and uh, you know the way the market works, there's there there's uh, you know more white people who don't want to live in the, in the black neighborhood, then the value of those properties is going to um, be diminished, you know. That's 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 another that's another part of it, and and because we've never come to terms with that or dealt with that directly in our policies, we are still in a situation where um, many of those same neighborhoods don't have the the property wealth that uh, that white neighborhoods do. So there's a there's a direct effect on wealth, and as you say, that funnels through through. Uh, school funding to the education that children in those neighborhoods receive. I'll say one other thing, one other aspect of that is that we have a property tax assessment system that often has racially discriminatory effects, um, you know, because it doesn't consider the factors that we were just talking about. And um, so often you're just looking, you're just looking at the sort of the square footage of the house or that sort of thing. And you end up over assessing uh, for property tax purposes, the value of a home in a, in a low income black neighborhood compared to a, um, you know, a higher, uh, a middle income white neighborhood. So you, you sort of getting on both sides, the value of your house is lower because of those policies and your, your, your tax assessment results in higher, higher taxes than would otherwise be the case. Hmm. So here's my wrap-up question for our conversation. I tend to be an internal optimist, and even in a pandemic, in the situation we're in, I have a certain amount of optimism in this way, that coming out of this pandemic, millions of people, I think, will realize how corrupt and dysfunctional our economic system is, not to mention our social system. And I wonder if then there's a conversation to be had about how we restructure our economic system to make a much healthier society. And it's specific to this question about state funding, not to take away at all the problems of state funding directly related to the pandemic and the notion that the federal government should put billions of dollars into state and localities. Doesn't this give an opportunity to say, wait a minute, shouldn't we be in fact taxing rich people higher in states at state levels Shouldn't we rethink the way in which we give out subsidies to corporations, especially at this local and state level, subsidies that are really about, in my view, uh, economic blackmail that bear that give no economic benefit to communities? So isn't this a time to engage the way in which states look at their budgets and create a much more fair society? Yeah, I think that that we'll see that over the next over the next couple of years that yeah, I mean, it's very likely that that even in the immediate term, the federal government isn't. I hope they do, but they. It looks like they're they're not going to provide enough aid, right? And so that's going to create uh, that in and of itself is going to create conver- the need for conversations within states about how do we raise the revenue that we need, um, 
And I do think that the pandemic and the recession and the, the federal government's policies over the last few years have created an environment where we are talking about some of these systemic factors more at a more serious in a more serious way. It's uh, um, so you know we're certainly encouraging uh, state policymakers to think about how do we better tax wealth, how do we and and the issue of economic development sub, so-called economic development subsidies that you lifted is uh, an important one. We spend a, we spend billions of dollars nationally on subsidies for of questionable value. Um, how do we turn the how do we think about how we are raising the revenue that we need in an equitable way and spending it in ways that are actually improving our lives uh, and not just enriching a few. Well, we're going to have to keep track of this. And I suspect that because the federal government is not going to give the money that the state needs, we're going to have to have you back and analyze the holes that we're looking at down the road and also try to be optimistic about what we can do. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate the chance. Nice talking to you. That'll do it for this week's show. Thanks to my guest, Michael Leachman. Our editor, as usual, is David Hebden. Our major sponsor is the American Postal Workers Union. You, too, can become a sponsor of this show. It's really, really easy. We've made it really easy for you to do this. You can do it in two ways. You can go over to workinglife.org, look for that podcast tab, and click on the link to Patreon. And there you can become a sponsor either on a one-time basis or if you want on a regular monthly basis or you can do it through Act Blue. We partnered up with Act Blue, which I'm sure you're familiar with through your political activism. You can go over to Act Blue, look for the Working Life Network with Jonathan Tassini, and you can there too become either a one-time sponsor or an ongoing monthly sponsor. We really appreciate our regular sponsors. That keeps our show going, allows us to keep bringing you this great information. Thanks for tuning in. Look forward to having you back next week.